want us to notice these words here. As we look in light of the coming of Jesus, oftentimes we lose sight of the fact that Christ is coming and our attention, you on me, Philip, and our attention is often placed upon things and events and times, nations, wars and rumors of wars, events that are transpiring as important as they are. We still must not lose sight of the fact that all of this is simply pointing us to the greatest event that has been pinned on parchment, and that is the coming of Jesus. I fear sometimes that we lose sight of the fact that in Christ's prayer, he prayed, Father, I will that they be with me where I am. That was Christ's burden. That was Christ's desire. When you read John uh, chapter 17, and I would encourage you to read that chapter and reread it and pray over it and ask God to open our minds and realize that that is the greatest event that the, the mind of man is to be pointed to. When we study the Bible, and specifically when we get to the prophecies and we begin to look at the books of Daniel and Revelation, we can begin to think that the purpose of the book is about beast and wars and persecution. And while all those things are related in these passages and, and, and they, 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 they take us from one point in time to the end of time. But brothers and sisters, many who are declaring these events are not going to be prepared because they have lost focus, losing focus on what the purpose of all these things are for, and that is to prepare us to be able to say with confidence, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. Let's not lose sight of that fact. If we have, may God bring our minds back to the purpose in which he has called us to the kingdom, for the purpose in which God has raised us up, to prepare the way for our Lord. John the Baptist's work, his greatest accomplishment was not baptizing. His greatest accomplishment was not uh, uh, telling Herod that that man, that he was unlawfully married. It was not rebuking the scribes and the Pharisees. It was not uh, uh, the eating of the locusts and the wild honey. It was not the wearing of camels here. This was not John's greatest accomplishment. As a matter of fact, we're going to go to our screen in a moment, but notice what the Bible tells us in the book of John, chapter 3. John, chapter 3, and John tells us what his greatest accomplishment in life was. As it relates to all of John's ministry, what was it that John felt was Success. How did John view success in his work? Notice what it says. The Gospel of John, chapter 3. And notice what it says concerning John as he makes this testimony concerning Jesus. And the Bible says, uh, beginning in verse 24. John 3, verse 24, the Bible says, For John was not yet cast into prison. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. They came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. John answered and said, a man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear witness, bear me witness, 
Then I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. He says, this my joy therefore is fulfilled. He that in, he must increase and I must decrease. This was John's greatest accomplishment. He says, this my joy is fulfilled, that I have heard the bridegroom's voice. And we must understand too that our greatest accomplishment will be to see the coming of Jesus. And often we have lost sight of this. And may God help us to reconnect with our purpose and our mission. I want us to go to our screens now. I want us to go to our screens and notice what it says. Christ is coming. The second coming of the Son of Man is to be, notice, the wonderful theme kept before the people. Here is a subject that should not be left out of our discourses. Eternal realities must be kept before the mind's eye. And the attraction, notice, of the world will appear as they are, altogether profitless and vanity. And so here we are instructed that the second coming of Jesus is to be a wonderful theme that is to be kept before the people. And then it says, these eternal realities must be kept before the mind's eye. And when it's talking about the mind's eye, it's talking about our understanding. It's talking about something that we ought to dwell upon. It's talking about in that frontal lobe where those critical decisions are made for life, where we are told the seal of God is to be placed. A decision there in uppermost in our minds, in that frontal lobe, that is to be the governing power of man, these eternal realities must be kept there. This is a theme that we are told is not to be left out of our discourses. It is something that, that, that we should dwell upon. We are told that this event of the coming of Christ is the very keynote of the scriptures, meaning that every other idea, everything that is in the word of God, the note that is struck, that sends the, the, that sets the tone for the word of God is the coming of Jesus Christ. This is the keynote of scripture. And this is to be the theme or the, 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 the note that, that sets the tempo and that sets the melody so that you and I could stay on course, that you and I can be able to hold this note as we walk through life, that Jesus is soon to come. Jesus is soon to come. We may not necessarily live as it were to see the final event that precedes the coming of Christ. But oh, brothers and sisters, we must live in preparation that we intend not to run to the rocks and the mountains, but we intend to embrace our Lord. We intend to see Jesus in peace. And it says, going on again, and it says, and as we do this, the attractions of the world will appear as they are. What is it? Profitless and vanity. Notice what just, it says here. It says, the truth, the truth that Christ is coming should be kept before every mind. 
Now, brothers and sisters, as we prepare for this event, as we keep before the mind's eye that Jesus is soon to come, wonderful reality, wonderful joy, the climax of our entire experience is, is to see and live and be with Jesus. As we understand this, brothers and sisters, we must understand that there is a preparation that must be made for the coming of Jesus. Quickly, Philip, there is a preparation that must be made. As a matter of fact, go in your Bibles to the book of 2 Peter. 2 Peter, notice what it says. 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter uh, chapter 3. I want us to notice this, brothers and sisters. What the Bible tells us here in 2 Peter chapter 3, as Peter, as it were, is signing off, as he is making his final statements, as he has already declared that this tabernacle, this body, he was soon to give up. He was soon to give up the ghost. He knew that death awaited him. Jesus told him that the end of his life, Peter would be led to a cross. Peter understood this was the death that he should die to glorify his Lord. And Peter, as he saw this day approaching, he didn't approach the throne of God like Hezekiah. He didn't approach with the mindset of, Lord, give me more time. Peter understood that his time, his days were numbered. And he didn't spend it in, in, in gloom and sadness, but encouraging the people of God, strengthening their hearts, helping them to realize that the coming of Jesus was no cunningly devised fable. When, they made known unto, when he made known unto the brethren the coming of the Lord Jesus, he said that he was eyewitnesses of his majesty. He saw what, what, would, what would be the scene of the coming of Jesus. He saw it and he said, and I declared it not as a fable, but as a living reality. But he says to the believers that, yes, I saw it. Yes, I heard the voice from the excellent glory. I heard the voice of God. I heard God speak from his throne. This is my beloved son. Hear ye him. He heard all these things. And brothers and sisters, he tells us that you and I have a more sure word of prophecy. That we do well to take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in our hearts. We have this sure word of prophecy. We have an understanding of what is soon to transpire. God has not left his people in ignorance concerning these things. But as Peter signs off in second Peter chapter three, he wants us to understand something concerning the coming of Jesus. He wants us to understand as well the, 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 the motive of the mission as we go forth, that God is not willing that anyone perish. Therefore, he tells us that it is a, that we must believe that everybody who would hear the word of God could be saved. We must believe that as we go forth. Yes, we understand that there are many who will not receive the word of God. Yes, we understand that there are those who are going to run to the rocks and the mountains. But, oh, brothers and sisters, God has not given us a description of any person per se who would not be saved. Therefore, it is our duty to preach and to witness as if everyone that we're witnessing to can be saved. What if, what if Stephen, as he was being stoned, what if Stephen would have looked at this crowd as baseless, as, 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 as full of, of, of evil as they were, what if he would have looked upon them as hopeless? He never would have uttered the words, Father, lay not this sin to their charge. And oh, what a glorious day that will be when he sees Paul, who was saw the one consenting to his death, standing there with a crown full of stars, representing all the souls that he saved as he saw the faithfulness of the martyr Stephen. And so brothers and sisters, as we preach, we must believe that people can be saved. Though they may appear to be our bitterest enemies, though they may appear to be on the, 
on the wrong side of the issue. We must hold out the scepter of favor, intending that they might receive forgiveness and and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in Christ. Notice what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. He tells us that in verse 1, this second, epistle, this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by the way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. And Peter says, for this they are willingly ignorant, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. And then he says in verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, the promise of his coming. But it says, as some men would count slackness, but is long suffering to us word, not willing that what? Any should perish, but that how many? All could come to what? Repentance. Now hold your finger. We're coming back, but notice what the Bible tells us in the book of Romans. Romans, the 10th chapter. All should come to repentance. This is God's hope. But oh, brothers and sisters, there's a choice that one must make. God is not willing that any should perish. His desire is that they would come to repentance. But the question is, if, if they're going to come to repentance, there must be someone that would seek by the power of the Holy Spirit to, to, to lead them to repentance. Someone that God would be willing to use to lead them to repentance. It says in Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 10, verse 13, the Bible says, For whosoever calleth upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Then it says in verse 14, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear, the Bible says, without a preacher? All who shall call upon the name of the Lord can be saved. Lord, save me. Those who have a desire to be saved, those who want deliverance from sin, if they call upon Jesus, he would save them. But how often, I'm not going to go there, all who shall call upon the name of the Lord, all who would hear the message of mercy and would call upon God for salvation, God says they can be saved. But how would they be saved without a preacher? God wants to bring them all to repentance. Therefore, the preachers must go to all that they might have opportunity to repent. This is why God has given a message that is to go to the ends of the earth. It is to be, it is to sound from one corner of the earth all the way to the other ends of the earth. We are not to measure who we believe is worthy to receive salvation. God says all, he means all. God says he wants all to come to repentance. Therefore, all must have an opportunity to repent from their sins. And therefore, God needs preachers. God needs those whom he can feel with his Holy Spirit. And yes, God is calling for those who would be willing to go. And he's not just calling for a select few. He's not just calling for those who have the ability to stand before a camera, who have the ability to stand by a podium. When you consider that woman by the well, who inspiration tells us was an evangelist. We are told that that woman had one encounter with Jesus and it, was, and it doesn't seem when you read John chapter four, it doesn't seem as though there was a long encounter, but through that encounter, the Bible says she went and got all the men 
of the city and brought them to Jesus. How often do we ever see the disciples when they were with Jesus bringing someone to Jesus? but we see the disciples restricting and barring the way to Christ. They were unwilling that anyone should get too close for fear that they would occupy a position higher than them, but they would, as it were, chase people away. The Syrophoenician woman came seeking Jesus, seeking his help, and all of a sudden the disciples said, send this woman away from us. But this woman at the well, living in open sin. But when she encountered Christ, as the message came home to the heart, as she saw that someone in front of her was actually wanting to give her something rather than take something from her. All the men she encountered, they all wanted something. But here was a man who was actually offering her something, something greater than she now possessed. And when she was willing to receive it into her heart, she went and brought a whole city to Jesus, we are told. If all must or if all can have an opportunity to repent, then all brothers and sisters must hear the gospel. And therefore we understand that God needs preachers. God needs preachers. Notice, let's go back to second, second Peter, second Peter chapter three. Notice what the Bible tells us, brothers and sisters in second Peter chapter three, God is not slack. He desires that all men should come to repentance. The Bible tells us here in the book of first, uh, second Peter chapter three and verse 10, it says, but the day of the Lord will come as a what? Thief in the night in the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. Now notice what it tells us here, brothers and sisters. He says, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be? in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of the Lord, wherein the heaven shall be on fire and shall be dissolved and the element shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, which dwelleth, wherein dwelleth righteousness, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent, we are told, that ye may be found in, him, found in him in peace without spot and blameless. As we are preparing for the coming of Jesus, as we are recognizing that prophecies around us are fast fulfilling, as we understand that the final movements are rapid, as we see that we're living in the, 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 the very toes of the image of Daniel chapter two, as we see the scroll coming to its final row, as all things seem to be moving with rapid pace to the climax of the coming of Jesus. And while we see it, But the question that we are asked, that we are told, the question that is brought before us, seeing that all these things are to be dissolved, the question is, what manner of person are ye to be? Peter is trying to take the mind back to a practical, everyday experience of godliness that shows that we are ready for the coming of the Lord. What manner of person ought we to be? Seeing that, notice, what what did he say? He says, wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent to be found in him, in peace, without spot and blameless. The Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Notice what it says in Ephesians chapter 5. Notice what the Bible tells us here. Jesus is coming back for a particular peculiar people. 
He is coming as it were for those who are looking for him. Those who are diligently, not slothfully, not haphazardly, but those who are diligently preparing for this event. They are not losing sight of the fact while they're preaching prophecy, while they're teaching and leading people to accept upon Jesus, they're not losing sight of the glorious event of the coming of Jesus. It is becoming a theme in their very lives, not just in their discourses, not just when they stand behind the desk, not just when the lights come on and the camera shines, but it is a theme of their life. It can be seen in their everyday transaction. It could be seen and heard in their discourses as they're sitting at their jobs, as, as people are discussing their retirement and their savings, while they're discussing their, their business endeavors, while they're discussing their, their futures in their long uh, life of prosperity upon this earth, in all of their transactions and all of their discourses and intercourses with humanity, there, the theme of their life is Jesus is soon to come. They don't have to end every conversation per se, that Jesus is soon to come, but the life shows it. The checkbook, the, the, the bank card, the home, the atmosphere, everything says they believe that Jesus is soon to come. It must become a living reality to us, brothers and sisters. It cannot be just something that we imagine, but it must dictate and it must, it must not motivate, but it must, um, um, it, 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 it has to be the balance as it were of our lives. It's the very thing that holds us together is the fact that I believe that Jesus is coming. And I believe that Jesus is coming for people that are without spot. I believe that I have to be found blameless, not of my own accord, but through the power of God and his grace and his ability to save. Notice what it says here in the book of Ephesians. Matter of fact, jump back to Ephesians chapter two. Ephesians. Uh, chapter two, I want to put this in here, brothers and sisters, Ephesians chapter two, verse eight, down to verse 10, Ephesians chapter two, verse 10, as we endeavor with all of our might to be ready for this event. John says that his joy was fulfilled when he heard the bridegroom's voice. We are told in a wonderful prophecy of Matthew 25 that a cry is given and people are stirred and the voice is heard, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. But when the bridegroom came, we are told that there were individuals who, who were not prepared for the event. They had gone out, but they allowed the things of the world to gain their attention. They allowed the fast fulfilling prophecies to take up their attention. They have made their religion, their salvation. And they began to prophesy and proclaim concerning the beast. And they saw what was happening in the world. They saw the falling of morality. They saw the increase of immorality. They saw the debaseness in the church. They saw standards trailing in the dust. And as they saw these things, they lost sight of the fact that they needed to keep their lamp trimmed and burning. They needed every morning and every evening to make sure that fire was upon the altar to consume self and sin. They forgot that fire had to be upon the altar of incense where their prayers were to be set before the Lord morning and evening. They forgot and understood that the light was not to go out but they were looking at these events. They saw them, but all oh, brothers and sisters, they lost sight of the fact that there had to be in heart preparation. Proclaiming the coming of Jesus is not enough to save anyone. We must be changed from within. And the Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians chapter two and verse eight, it says, for by grace, 
are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God before ordained that we should walk, notice, walk in them, not just saying that by grace alone, but by grace are you saved. It is a gift. Salvation is something that we don't merit of our own accord. It is something that is promised to God. And God says, for whosoever believeth on me shall be saved. Whosoever calleth upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And God through Christ has set before us good works, works that we ought to walk in, works that ought to be emulated in the life, works that ought to be demonstrated before the world. And we're not doing it as if we're trying to earn God's favor. We are doing it because by Christ, he has given us his favor and we walk in the commandments of God and we do that which is pleasing in his sight. But we must not lose sight of the fact that while upon this earth, it is a temporary place. We are pilgrims. We are strangers. And this is why we must be concerned about the saving of others. We must be concerned about those who are endeavoring to preach the message like us. And we must endeavor to see what can I do? What can I do to make sure that you have what you need in order to accomplish your work? Can you imagine if soldiers went out on a battlefield? Can you imagine as the enemy started approaching? Can you imagine if someone's ammunition went out and someone also had more ammunition, but for fear and concern about their own lives, they left their brother without ammunition. Well, that's one less person they have to help and assist and protect them. But how often is it seen among us? as those who believe Jesus is about to come, as we're watching people fall because of a lack of admonition, ad, ad, admonition and admonition, amen. And we're not encouraging people to fight the good fight of faith. We're looking for failures, but oh, brothers and sisters, God wants to do a work in us as we keep before the mind's eye the reality that Jesus is about to come, the things of this earth are, will be seen as they are profitless and vanity. Notice what it says in Ephesians 5. Jesus is coming for a particular people and we want to be ready as it is kept before the mind's eye. Jesus is soon to come. I begin to understand that there's a work of preparation that must be done in the heart and in the life to be able to meet Jesus as he would have me to meet him in peace, without spot, blameless, sins washed away, not just forgiven, but blotted out. Characters reflecting the lovely image of Jesus, the same burden for souls that Jesus has felt. Notice what it says, Ephesians 5. Ephesians chapter 5, the Bible tells us here, beginning at verse 25, Ephesians 5, beginning at verse 25, it says, husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, verse 26, that he might what? Sanctify, cleanse it with the washing of the water by the what? Word, that he might present it to himself. What type of church? A glorious church, not having what? spot or what wrinkle or what any such thing, something that would resemble a blemish, something that would be a thread out of place, something that would not be in harmony with the perfect garments of righteousness. God is looking. We're being examined brothers and sisters. I saw where soldiers in Washington, DC, at that, that, that national cemetery. As I went and I took, and as the family, we went and we, we said, we want to visit the, the tomb of the unknown soldier. And as we went there, and as we uh, uh, saw these soldiers move meticulously, guarding a tomb of someone they don't know, but they have given this glorious honor 
Praise God, no one has to guard the tomb of Jesus. Praise God, our Lord is risen. Praise God, we don't worship the dead. Praise God, we serve the God of the living. Notice, brothers and sisters, but as I watched a documentary on these soldiers, and I watched the close examination that is done in preparation for them just to go and stand before a tomb. The man comes in and he examines, he circles these individuals, he brings out his ruler, he makes sure that all his pins are and the, the exact proportion as they ought to be, inches away from buttons, inches away from cups, as I watch, as they take their lighters, their fire, and they go around this man to see if there's any loose threads so that they may be burned off. And they go flawlessly, as it were, before the people. And they're not there to impress the people. They're there at the command of their soldiers. And they're being watched by their superiors as they move to see if their flaws, if men are this concerned about standing before an open tomb, how concerned ought we to be to stand before a living God before his throne? We must search our hearts. We must understand as we're keeping this theme, there is a heart work that needs to be done. There is a character that must be developed. And this character will be developed as we behold Jesus. He is the only one that can change us, brothers and sisters. He is the only one that can bring about the necessary changes that must be made in the character and in the life. Work will not make the change. We can knock on a thousand doors, but trying to do it will not get it done. Notice what it says. Notice what Paul says uh, in the book of Philippians chapter three. Paul understood the worthlessness of forms and formality. Paul had a zeal, he said, but his zeal was seen in the wrong direction. He said he thought that he needed to do many things contrary to Jesus. He didn't understand what he was fighting against, but when he saw Christ, but when he saw the love of God, there was something in his life that changed and he allowed the forms of religion to be put in their place. And that was in the dust. Notice what he says. In the book of Philippians chapter three, chapter three, beginning in verse three, Philippians chapter three, verse three, the Bible says, for we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus, have no confidence in the flesh, though I might also have confidence in the flesh. If any man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, he says, I'm more. And he begins to list the various things that have been noted in his life that made him such an honorable man among men. As he walked in the church, they would honor him. He was respected as he walked down the street for his religious attainments and his religious acquirements. He was recognized, brothers and sisters, by, by, by earthly, worldly superiors as he was honored as a bright and shining light in the church. But brothers and sisters, when he saw Jesus, it all became nothing to him. Notice what he says. He says, circumcised I was on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a, he a Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law. He said a Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness, which is in the law. He says he was blameless. Now notice he's not talking about the law of God because when you look in Romans chapter seven, he shows that when the law was revived, that when the law came sin revived and he died in comparison of his life to the law of God, to the great standard of righteousness, he saw himself as worthless and lost. But when it came to the laws of men, when it came to the standards of the church, when it came to the policies of the church, when it came to doing that which the church required, he said, I was blameless. 
I did everything that the manual said. I followed all the standards of the church. I abided by the 29 fundamentals. I, 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 I lived as it were. He says, I was as touching the law. He said, I'm blameless. But then he says, but what things were gained to me, those I counted laws for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but laws for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Verse nine, and be found in him, not having what? Mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith, through the faith of Christ, the righteousness of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. The first resurrection. Paul understood, brothers and sisters, that it was not about the attainments and the recognitions of the church. It wasn't about preachers standing over us at our death, preaching about how good we were, how beloved we are. Not, not the declaration of some man pronouncing us in heaven when he has no authority, when he himself would not even, may not even be in heaven. How often have we gone to churches? How often have we heard men stand in pulpits and declare that individuals are going to be in heaven as though God gave them some, some notice of authority to say who's going to be and who won't be. But this is not our accomplishment to hear someone standing over us. Matter of fact, you won't hear it, but to have someone standing over us at our funerals, declaring that we are going to see Jesus. Oh yes, brothers and sisters, we're all going to see Jesus, but some are going to run to the rocks and the mountains. Brothers and sisters, we must be found in Christ, not having our own righteousness, which measures by man's standards, but the righteousness, which is a faith, which is given to us by faith, which is given to us by God in exchange for our garments of filthiness. We exchange our life for the life of his. We are willing to walk in his works. We are willing to walk in the path that God has laid for us. Notice these statements here. I'm not going to hold you much longer. Brothers and sisters, our theme for the week is going to be, and may it become the theme for our lives. Prepare, prepare, prepare to meet thy God. Notice what it says in this age, brothers and sisters, just prior to the second coming of Christ. It's on your screen here. Notice in this age, just prior to the second coming of Christ in the clouds of heaven. Such a work as that of John is to be done. God calls for men who will prepare a people to stand in the great day of the Lord. The message preceding the public ministry of Christ was repent publicans and sinners repent Pharisees and Sadducees repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand as a people who believe in Christ's soon coming, we have a message to bear. And what is that message? Prepare to meet thy God. Prepare to meet thy God. Bearing the message is not just preaching the message verbally. Bearing the message is living it. Bearing the message is not just proclaiming because we can stand and proclaim and live like an unbeliever. But God is calling us to bear in our words, in our conversations. Peter says, 
What manner of person ought we to be in all manner of holy conversation and godliness in all aspects of which we communicate? We communicate by our body language. We communicate by our facial expressions. Isaiah says, thy countenance doth bear witness against thee. Our words, our demeanor, our dress. When Elijah was on his way to the king and when the king sent to the, to the gods of Ekron and all of a sudden Elijah met them and said, he's not going to come down from off that bed, but he will die. When they came back to the king, he said, why have you come so soon? Second Kings chapter one. Why are you come so soon? A man met us and told us and sent us with a message. He said, what, who was the man? He said, like, I don't know, but he was dressed in Campbell's hair. He said, that was Elijah. Our dress tells brothers and sisters, it bears a message in all manner of conversation and godliness and what we say and what we dress, how we eat, how we live. All of it is to bear the message, prepare to meet thy God. Notice what it says here, brothers and sisters. In this age, hmm, I did it twice. Notice what it says. In order, in order to give such a message as John gave. Now remember, remember what it said back here. It says, in this age, just prior to the second coming of Christ and the clouds of heaven, such a work as that of John is to be done. In order to give such a message as John gave, we must have a what? Spiritual experience like his. That has to sink in, brothers and sisters. In order to give such a message as John gave, we must have a spiritual experience like his. So prior to the coming of Jesus, if we are to bear a message of repentance, we ourselves must have had prior repentance. We must have had a prior experience because we cannot bear a message in truth that we do not possess. It will lose its power upon our lips. We cannot call out of Babylon while we are still entrenched in its practices in our lives. Are we preparing to meet our God or are we preparing for the plagues? It says in order to give, notice your screen, in order to give such a message as John gave, we must have a spiritual experience like he is. This same work, watch this, this same work must be wrought in us. We must, notice, behold God. And in beholding him, lose sight of self. This is what we must do, brothers and sisters. We must behold him. We must see Christ in his word. We must see his life. We must behold his life. And when the Bible is speaking about beholding, is not talking about glancing, is not talking about looking at, uh, looking, at him, looking at him through our peripheral vision, is not talking about casting a glance and then turning back. No, it's talking about meditating. It's talking about focusing, like taking a picture. The picture will give you a clear shot, but the lens, you can see it adjusting. It's adjusting to focus on the very object that is facing and its iris. It grabs it and it snaps the picture. We must behold so that his life makes an impression upon the mind that cannot be erased by the various uh, uh, circumstances that we find ourselves in. Peter, he was with Jesus. He saw him. He talked with him. We are told he was even, he had even received power. He, he, 
He understood to a great degree. Jesus says, who do men say that I am? But who do you say I am? He said, thou art the Christ. He said to Peter, he said to the 12, are you going to go? Peter said, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of life. They knew Jesus not to be an imposter. Peter had had various experiences where he had seen the power of God working. Peter walked on water. Peter, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee upon the water. Come, Peter walked on water. He sunk, Lord, save me. Peter, Lord, carest thou not that we perish? Peter saw the power of God. But when circumstances pressed in close, what was Peter's advice to the multitude? Flee. What was Peter's words to when he was exposed? I know not the man. I don't know him. I've been around him. I've sat at his feet. I've listened to his sanctified words. My heart burned when, they, when he spoke. I saw miracles, but I don't know the man. I didn't perceive the power of God leaving him and coming into me. That virtue that fell upon that woman who had the issue of blood, that never happened in my life. I was with him, but I did not discern his sanctifying, transforming power. Lazarus can say he knows him. Lazarus was dead and, and, and yet liveth through the power of Christ. But self in me is still alive. I'm still living. If you want to know it, you keep asking me and I'm going to tell you and through cursing and swearing, he said, I don't know the man. So brothers and sisters, we're not talking about this haphazard, casual, one day a week, showing up for church, coming late to Sabbath school, if there's Sabbath school, sleeping through 11 o'clock hour, going home, fancying ourselves that we're spending time with God in nature while we're waiting for the Sabbath to close so we can go back to our secular, ungodly lives, moving through life as though we have no soul to lose and a hell to shun. This is not the beholding that Jesus is speaking about. This is not the beholding that we must, this is not the beholding that we must experience in order to lose sight of self. We have to, brothers and sisters, gaze upon Jesus. We have to stare, as it were, captivated by what we know about his life. So much so that it, that it becomes the very talk of, 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 it becomes the very conversation in which we find ourselves constantly communicating about. This life must be lost in the sight of Jesus. Self has to be put to death. But how can we do this? I cannot empty myself of self, but I can consent to Christ to do the work for me. But I will never consent to Christ, consent to Christ to do anything if I don't trust him with all my heart. If I don't know him, I can say like Pilate in John 19, behold the man. I can say it. And what was the response when they beheld him? Give us Barabbas. So this is not the experience that God is looking for us to have. It is an experience, brothers and sisters, that we find in Matthew chapter eight, when that centurion soldier as he reflected upon the power of God and the loveliness of his character, Jesus' proclamation concerning that testimony was, I have not found so great faith. No, not even in the church. This is how we behold him, brothers and sisters, because we're beholding him in preparation for meeting Jesus. Now, brothers and sisters, when we come back tomorrow night, by the grace of God, we are going to continue to see how and what God is asking us to do in preparation of preparing to meet our God. But the question for us tonight, where is Jesus in relation to our experience? Are we walking about in the sparks of our own kindling or are we trusting in the power of his grace? Is God truly living in us? 
and the works that we do are works of Christ or is what people see is that those of us who have made a religion out of our, who have made, who have made our gospel service, a religion and our salvation to the point that when Jesus comes, that we are going to feel that God had, that we have, that we will have the audacity to look at Jesus and question his judgment and not allowing us to be in heaven. And what will those who have not beheld Christ point to? They will point to all that they have done. While those who are saved recognize that it is by the grace of God and it is not of themselves, they recognize that it is a gift. They don't come with any accolades before the throne of God, but those who are lost and who have made their work, their religion and their salvation will look to Jesus and question his ability and not permitting them to come in. But brothers and sisters, where are we today? Are we ready to meet Jesus? Are we ready to look full into his face? Well, brothers and sisters, you know, like when the sun rises in the morning, the sun doesn't just pops up. It, as it were, it, 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 it awakens the earth with his warm rays before the sun is ever seen is rays prepares the earth for its full blaze of glory. And brothers and sisters, God is sending us the rays in his word to prepare us to look full into his wonderful face. John says we are going to see his face, but not until brothers and sisters, we're willing to look and see him in his word. And today, brothers and sisters, God is willing to come into our hearts. Today, Jesus is willing to live in us. Today, Jesus is willing to, to make a new his people. But too often, brothers and sisters, we're satisfied. We're satisfied with self. We're satisfied with our accomplishments. And we, in our minds, are unwilling to look back on our lives and be willing, like Paul was, to say all that, I count that but dumb because we feel that we've accomplished too much. I prayed for this. Why would God want me to get rid of this? Why would God want me? And like the rich young ruler, we're willing to walk away. We're willing to walk away from Jesus if we could keep self. But today, brothers and sisters, Jesus is waiting to come into our hearts. As we sing this closing song, I pray that you would sing along, that you would listen meditatively, as Jesus speaks to us in these words. The Savior is waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you let him come in? There's nothing in this world to keep you apart. What is your answer to him? Time after time, he has waited before, and now he's waiting again to see if you're willing to door oh how he wants to come in if you'll take one step toward the savior my friend you'll find his arms open wide receive him and all of your darkness will end within your heart he'll abide time after time 
He has waited before, and now he is waiting again to see if you're willing to open the door. Oh, how he wants to come in. Time after time, he has waited before, and now he is waiting again to see if you're willing to open the door.